Welcome to the show, everyone. It's the Crypto Lark. I'm super excited to have back on the show Jamie Skello from Horizon State. Jamie, welcome. Hello, man. How are you? Thanks for having me again. Now, I really wanted to have you back on because there's been so many exciting things happening at Horizon State. And we're not going to, in this video, we're not going to talk about exactly what Horizon State does. I've done another interview with you before. For anyone who's interested in more details about exactly what Horizon State does, go check that interview out. But today, I want to talk about some of the exciting partnerships that you've been doing recently. So I think a great place for us to start, you have signed a recent partnership deal with Nad Latul Aluma. We're going to say NU because it's a lot easier to say. This is the world's yep. largest socio-religious group with 96 million members in Indonesia. What does this partnership mean for you? What are you doing? Give us some details. Um, so look, this, uh, this opportunity was actually uh, born out of some conversations that uh, were kicked off with, uh, with Oren, Oren Al Alazraki, and I'm sure we'll dive into uh, what his appointment means for us shortly as well. Um, but it's, it's, it's looking like it could quite literally be the biggest commercial opportunity so far uh, in crypto uh, generally, which is, which is a tremendous achievement for us. But effectively what it means is, is kind of like we're one step, one step closer to, to, I guess, what we would describe as, as mass adoption, which I know is a, a sort of a popular term um, within the community because we will quite literally have tens of millions of people utilizing our technology um, for the purposes of uh, opinion solicitation and voting and, and polling on policy matters um, around the country. Um, there's actually two opportunities in Indonesia in right now which we have uh, signed on for. One of them uh, is in respect to a, a provincial pilot uh, and the other one is in regards to the NU which is um, arguably a, a much bigger opportunity. Now when we're talking about these very specific uh, communities I suppose um, you might relate them to suburbs or councils or, or perhaps uh, states based on the, 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 the sheer volume of people in these places but the NU is um, a particularly important deal for us and it's a perfect example of the kinds of uh, um, the kinds of I guess use cases and applications of this technology which don't necessarily relate to something um, specifically political in nature right so this is this is very much about community engagement community empowerment mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're, we're really excited to get that rolled out um, by the end of the year uh, we're ambitiously quite literally looking um, to have tens of millions of of, of the NU member base uh, over there, utilizing um, our platform to uh, be collaboratively uh, making decisions on on the uh, the sort of policy matters that affect them and their organization and, uh, and their communities. That's amazing. This is such a big partnership, and I feel like it's it's kind of gone under the radar to an extent. I know a lot of people were talking about Verge and what they did with their partnership, but this is like way bigger and cooler because this is you know actually empowering people to make their own decisions. This isn't just you know I can pay for something somewhere using crypto. This is actually we're going to be empowering communities to help make better decisions and be you know more part of their community via cryptocurrency yeah. and blockchain technology, which is super cool, which is super cool. Now, why, I guess, you know, obviously Indonesia is a place where internet is becoming much bigger and technology is, you know, they've got one of the world's largest um, internet user bases, but what really made a good fit for Horizon State and the NU? Well, look, I think, uh, well, in terms of the NU specifically, their organization, uh, we are very much philosophically aligned in terms of the kinds of change that we want to see in the world. So they are um, a, a sort of promoting and, and practicing anti-extremism. Uh, they're a very progressive group, uh, very forward thinking. Uh, they do a lot of great socioeconomic work in the region as well in terms of the building of hospitals and schools. And uh, so they're, they're doing really great work. Um, you know, and when we talk about the term Islam, unfortunately, in a lot of places around the world, there are immediate negative connotations. Um, but this group is very specifically uh, practicing peace uh, and trying to work towards a, a future of prosperity for, for everybody. So, you know, in terms of organization alignment, it's strong. Uh, in terms of the market opportunity, um, I, I think it's... Um, it's quite a privilege to be able to roll something out which can have a, a genuine uh, impact on people's lives, a positive impact, given the fact that um, much of the, the country is unfortunately still underprivileged, especially compared to other nations which have, uh, which have already developed. Um, and then we think about the uh, technological opportunity. And of course, um, Indonesia actually has uh, a vast uh, smartphone penetration, um, as does many countries around Southeast Asia now, especially compared to other developing nations uh, in regards to overall uh, adoption percentages. I mean, you look at Africa and India and uh, many places in, in Southeast Asia are really streaming ahead in that regard. And so what it means is that um, not only uh, are we able to uh, look at entering uh, a region which uh, could certainly do 
uh, and benefit from this kind of technology being implemented, but but they're ready to have it impl implemented as well. They're sort of uh, they're primed for adoption. So it's uh, it's it's tick 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 in all those boxes. That's great. It's it's a perfect storm situation of they want it, you have it, and everyone come to the table and work on it. Now there's going to be you mentioned the provincial pilot, and is that what you're talking about on the island of Sumatra? Yeah, and, and look, that's um, that's one that I actually can't go into too much more detail other than what we've actually already spoken about in the press release. Um, but that will probably kick off at this point in time. That's going to kick off before uh, the the broader rollout for the NU. So um, look, we're going to continue to progressively disclose as much as we can uh, about that that deal and those timelines. Um, but yeah, the entire team uh, um, right now over in Wellington is uh, is working very very hard. Uh, towards those type deadlines, I know that we've got a few of our uh, our Melbourne personnel over in New Zealand now for workshops as we flesh out this product um, and actually write the code that hasn't been written yet and uh, and think about all the new design challenges. Um, the the NU stuff is an interesting um, extrapolation of, of the core product as well. You know, we've talked for a long time now about how this is much bigger than voting. Um, and so, uh, as an example, financial services will very very likely form a, a piece of uh, the puzzle and what we present to our uh, twin users over there in Indonesia uh, uh, and any community ultimately that wants to use this platform. So we partnered up with uh, MCV Cap, which is an Indonesian financial services operation, um, and we expect uh, to be signing on many more partners over the over the coming months and, and obviously years uh, in respect to effectively um, utilizing our platform and our integrating services uh, atop of it that are going to help again empower our communities in ways that they haven't otherwise been. So. The voting stuff is, is a bit of a no-brainer, really. It creates uh, trust where trust didn't previously exist. It mm -hmm. decentralizes that sort of uh, ballot box or any kind of record of results. So it's not owned by an institution or a government, which, of course, uh, provides a lot of assurance to the people involved in that collaborative decision-making uh, process. But, you know, on the topic of financial services, uh, we'll be able to deliver both fiat and crypto services uh, to some people that uh, are currently unbanked. And so in one way, we get to bank the unbanked uh, because fiat services will be made available to them through these partnerships, uh, but also uh, in in the, in the other direction where kind of unbanking the banks if they choose to do so, because, uh, you know, crypto enables that sort of that peer-to-peer that -peer interaction, um, the, that opportunity for a medium of exchange and, and commerce and trade uh, without necessarily an institution uh, if they choose not to do so. Very interesting. And for anyone who doesn't kind of know some of the backstory about Indonesia, Indonesia is a country that has historically been absolutely plagued by corruption. Uh, if you look at the island of Sumatra, which when I first read it, I was like, wow, what an awesome use case because so much corruption has happened there. So much community disempowerment has happened where people's forests are cut down and things like this and land stolen and on and on and on goes the story of how corruption and disempowerment have had negative effects on the communities there. So to see people being given the tools to take control of their communities again is absolutely massive. Now, how can you, thinking about the corruption aspect, how do you overcome the corruption in a country like Indonesia? Well, I mean, uh, simply you, you don't, at least not overnight. Um, this is about uh, positive steps. It's about progression. It's about moving forward. And so in a similar vein to our technology, uh, you know, where it's not necessarily going to be an overnight switch from, from analog to digital, from, from paper, um, to the blockchain. Uh, we, uh, we're not sort of under any illusion that there is a perfect solution or that we can change the world overnight. Uh, but it's about continuing to, to move as, as rapidly as we can in the right direction. Um, and in some places, we'll have the opportunity uh, to go top down. Uh, and in other places, we really need to start grassroots and, and empower communities um, sort of outside of what I guess would be considered formal politics and, and hopefully then go up the chain from there. So it just really depends on the market. It depends on the region. It depends on, well, in, in some ways, the, the customer. Um, and what we believe is the right strategy for having the greatest effect. Um, but look, we, we hope uh, and we honestly believe that the tools that we're creating and that we're deploying, not only in Indonesia, but, but around the world, uh, really will have that opportunity to to help play a role in, in the eradication of corruption in the long term. But uh, yeah, absolutely not an overnight fix. Yeah, this it's it's a it's a big problem and it's been there for a long time and it's a lot of people have a lot of interests at stake, right? So it's it's a slow but sure process. We will overcome these things. And I feel like the transparency offered by blockchain technology as well as the empowerment offered by services like Horizon State can really have an impact on that moving forward. Now Democracy as a platform service. Can you expand on that thought a little bit? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a sort of uh, a label that we've been banning about internally, really. Um, but it's uh, when we think about democracy, obviously, you have the political connotations, uh, things like electoral processes. But of course, democracy is is much more than that. Democracy is ultimately about uh, collaborative decision making processes. Uh, it's a it's a it's a process that's really designed to be um, engaged in and conducted by the people to come to uh, outcomes which are ultimately the best possible ones in an ideal world. Um, and of course, that requires um, a whole bunch of, uh, I guess, preliminary steps, precursors um, to achieve that. So it's not necessarily just about the vote. The vote is part of the democratic process, um, but there's a lot more to it. I mean, there's information uh, distribution and dissemination. There is, um, you know, deliberation of various kinds. And so the, the, the system, again, that we're providing is, is not just about the vote. That is the end point. There's a lot of work that we have to do across the board to make sure that our democratic outcomes are actually as uh, high quality as they, are, as, as they can be. So it's not just about making the vote cheaper or more efficient or more secure or soliciting the opinion in, in similar ways uh, or polling in similar ways. Uh, it's about how do we actually arrive at higher quality outcomes. And so that's, I mean, that's the big, bold grand vision for us. Um, and there are lots of pieces within this technology which we are, have either built or are continuing to build out, which help facilitate those processes in more meaningful ways and, and hopefully will, will take us to a place where we're actually um, uh, generally uh, achieving better democratic outcomes. And this, of course, isn't, again, just for political uh, use. Um, we're talking to some prominent football clubs throughout Europe for membership engagement. We are talking to listed businesses for, for uh, their sort of AGMs and shareholder votes. So, uh, you know, democratic processes uh, are far and wide. Absolutely, absolutely. You have to get, uh, you know, the, the family unit too in there at some point. <laughs> okay, kids, we're going to Disneyland. Who votes yes? It's not on the blockchain, <laughs> Dad. We're not going there. <laughs> oh, great. Now, social impact is really, I feel like it's becoming this big use case for blockchain technology, but I feel like some people still don't believe that it's possible. What would you say to all those like really skeptical people? Because I always get people saying, no, blockchain and voting, never going to happen, impossible. What would you say to the skeptics? Well, look, you take a business like Horizon State, which is effectively a profit for purpose business. Uh, we have a token ecosystem and we have uh, blockchain based technology. Um, but then you have many other applications for the technology which don't necessarily resemble any business sort of in this uh, in this startup landscape. And I think there's a couple really clear examples of this happening uh, abroad in places that really need it, which is quite incredible. So I'll give you a few examples. Uh, I believe it was UNICEF who recently uh, created a, a sort of a web service, it's a brand new web page, which uh, it fires up and uh, through um, more or less uh, you granting access to your computer, to GPU and CPU cycles through JavaScript, I believe, um, you are effectively mining cryptocurrency out of your web browser. Um, and that's being donated in real time uh, to UNICEF for, uh, you know, uh, to basically help the underprivileged in, in various places around the world. So that's a very, very simple implementation of how um, this technology is being used for good. Uh, but in a, but in an incredibly, um, I guess, stereotypical way in that it, it really leverages cryptocurrency and the mining of cryptocurrency. Um, and then you have some, uh, some ideas that go a little bit deeper. Um, so recently, um, in Jordanian camps uh, with Syrian refugees, as these refugees were entering the camps, um, their uh, their retinas were scanned uh, in terms of establishing biometric ID, uh, and then they were they were more or less granted food stamps or or, uh, or funds for food um, on a blockchain, which related to their biometric ID, and so. This meant that they didn't even need a, a smartphone uh, to access their funds or transfer money because it's obviously a very specific purpose. But what it does is it stops the potential for double spend. It, it mm -hmm. stops the potential for theft, um, robbery. Um, and so you would walk into one of these stalls uh, at a at a joint eating camp, and they would scan your retina, and uh, they would deduct, um, you know, the value of, of the food that you've taken away. So uh, again, um, that is a perfect example of how the blockchain technology itself, while there is still a currency spin to it, it really has nothing to do uh, with with ICOs or the the blockchain startup world, as many people see it uh, in the press and mm -hmm. of course uh, all over the internet right now. If you're paying attention to this scene, um, I guess one other example is. Uh, supply chain and not just supply chain for for what is I guess a strictly commercial gain um, but supply chain for the purposes of improving the quality of lives for, for people in that supply chain uh, including conflict and blood diamonds and so um, it might be Everledger I think it's Everledger I may have got that wrong so look it up but effectively the uh, the scanning in of 40 characteristics of any diamond at the at the site of mine 
um, and then being able to track that through the supply chain and make sure that um, all of uh, the, the processes and procedures uh, and HR policies and everything else that, that happens uh, are all above board so that the people getting the diamonds in a retail store um, can sort of have that stamp of approval um, that unfortunately, well, that positively nobody would have been unfortunately harmed in, uh, in the mining or distribution um, of that, of that uh, precious good. Nice. So essentially, you know, the skeptics are always going to be there saying, ah, you can't do that on the sideline. But actually, these things are happening right now. These use cases are here. They're right. happening. They're moving forward. So, you know, to all the Look naysayers, things, <laughs> it happens. Exactly. So, so, so there is lots of uh, even more fascinating stuff that hasn't happened yet. But those are examples that have already happened. And, and they've, they've been going on since last year, in fact. Um, uh, so it's 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 happening at an increasing rate, and all you have to really do is look around and do any kind of research to appreciate the, the social impact that it's already having. This this technology, uh, sure, it's emerging technology, but it's real, it's tangible, it's being utilised right now. Uh, I mean, I, I'm in Malaysia uh, this week. Um, our, our blockchain voting technology has been in real use since February last year for my vote, and uh, here in Malaysia, it was put to use at the uh, the Remtech Awards at the GFRID. Uh, summit, which is a World Bank event, um, effectively voting on winners for a remittances innovation award program. Um, and so it, there are a lot of use cases um, which are already happening. It's not It's not sort of, um, we'll see what happens in five years. Mm -hmm. Stuff's going on right now. Right now, right now. And that's the important thing to remember. That's why it's all so exciting. You kind of beat me to my next question, which is going to be about my vote. So that that's kind of what you guys are doing with my vote is, you know, helping them provide services just like that in Malaysia. So this, uh, this event in Malaysia was really a, a direct partnership between um, Remtech, the uh, Remtech Awards um, and uh, Horizon State. But the system that we delivered for use here was very, very similar to the system that is currently in use by my vote in that it isn't necessarily um, that broader uh, democracy as a platform uh, offering. It is something much more specific to information delivery. Uh, encouraging appropriate consumption and then soliciting that vote. Um, now, m my vote's having some tremendous success around the world as well. I, I obviously uh, I don't want to make the mistake of uh, pre-announcing anything for my vote because I've made that mistake before. But I do believe they are uh, they're publicly talking about um, some opportunities um, in Iowa and the Northern Territory of Australia. Um, people would have heard about uh, Scotland. People would have. Um, heard about numerous other places within uh, the European region as well. So um, they're making uh, very much an international push now to try and propagate um, their model for democratic reform, which really encourages a kind of um, a direct democracy within a representative democracy where people are given better information to become informed and, and become an informed citizen and, and make informed decisions. And then having the right people in place to actually honor uh, the decisions of that informed majority uh, rather than having politicians play fame games and uh, really work mm -hmm. towards being career politicians and setting their own agenda. So trying to instill a, a truer democracy within our existing ones. Is all that. Yes, but when we have a direct democracy, Brexit happens. Um, now, I'm sure there are people that still believe that Brexit uh, was the right uh, sort of course of action uh, for the United Kingdom, but um, I think the large majority uh, and, in, and an increasingly large majority, majority believe that it seems to have been a mistake and a lot of people unfortunately voted against themselves. But this isn't because people are, um, you know, intrinsically silly. This is uh, ultimately because of misinformation, party mm -hmm. spin, things like Cambridge Analytica. Um, so when you're when you're given shitty inputs, usually you get shit outputs. Uh, and so a big a big part of my vote's mission is to uh, actually improve that. Uh, and again, that philosophy of sort of um, improving the quality of our democratic outcomes, not just the efficiency or the security or uh, the the price of that outcome. Um, so uh, for for those who aren't familiar with how it all works, there they've effectively got an internationally distributed team of researchers and analysts and PhDs who collaborate on information packs that relate to the issue at hand. Um, and it's, it's about having a, a frequent conversation um, and making sure that those information packs are as objective and as unbiased as they possibly can be, because you've got people from the left of politics and people from the right. And, you know, you've got uh, citizens of various countries within Europe and citizens of Australia. And if they can come to sort of um, uh, basically a bit of a, a, a nod that this is this is good to go and I think you've probably arrived at a, at a pretty decent place if all those varying uh, you know positions uh, and opinions can can come together and say this is this is the most accurate sort of worldview on this issue uh, and this is this is the information that we believe people should be using to make better decisions so look it's not perfect because whenever you interpret information as a human being there is some bias applied 
But as per you know, uh, the earlier part of our conversation, this isn't about perfect solutions. This is about better solutions. We've just got to keep trying uh, to take uh, positive steps in the right direction. Nice. Now, I want to go on to some Horizon State uh, news that's happened kind of recently. It's very exciting. It's, you know, not about partnerships and stuff, but actually you've joined the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. What do you get from that? How, how are you looking to benefit from that? And how are you looking to add to the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance ecosystem? So uh, the EEA has some working groups, which we are looking at uh, becoming a part of, and in fact, uh, leading one or two of in respect to uh, governance uh, and the democratic uh, use cases for this technology. Um, <coughs> and of course, for us, um, you know, with, with uh, numerous um, potential revenue streams, both in politics and in enterprise uh, and within, uh, you know, NGO, what the opportunity for us is um, to help collaborate on the technologies which might be of best use uh, in certain customer opportunities while fostering relationships with some enormous brands uh, who we might have the opportunity to uh, to work with in an even more close manner into the future. So I'm sure people have seen the caliber of, uh, of organizations that are already uh, a member of the EEA. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor for us uh, to join that company. Uh, it's, it's a pretty impressive list. Um, with some of the world's biggest you know, tech giants already on there. Um, but it's also worth no noting that we are, uh, we are blockchain agnostic uh, in the sense that um, uh, Ethereum is, is, a, is a clear option and it has some significant pros, but right now it also has a few cons uh, in regard to scaling. Um, but we don't necessarily need to use um, Ethereum for the process, for example, of casting a vote to the blockchain. Um, and so we appraise the technologies that are used on a case-by-case -case basis. Maybe here in Malaysia, Ethereum made sense for the Remtech Awards at GFRID, um, but in other use cases, um, it might not. Uh, and it mm -hmm. might, in fact, be a distant second or maybe even a third or a fourth, fourth place option for, for that uh, activity. So um, we are in a relatively luxurious spot in that position um, because we aren't completely wedded to one blockchain and thus we aren't hindered by the pace at which it moves. Interesting. Final bit of news I want to touch on. You've got a new CEO, Oren Erezlaki. Mm. What's he bringing to the table? So um, I'm a startup guy, and uh, you know I've, I've built um, digital products and services and, um, and startup businesses uh, numerous times over my sort of 20-year stint in, uh, in technology and experience design. Um, what I haven't had any experience with yet really is running large organizations at scale for the caliber of customers, which we are very quickly attracting. You know, you're talking about um, slow moving governments, you're talking about enormous uh, and bureaucratic uh, enterprise uh, and other international institutions. Um, and Oren comes from a background of, of dealing and managing and growing just that. Um, so he was uh, formerly a general manager at uh, Datacom, which is uh, a multinational IT consultancy. Uh, you know, they've got thousands and thousands and thousands of staff and uh, they, uh, they, they turn over about $1.5 billion a year. And so they're, they're a big company. Uh, and he, uh, he was an integral part of that um, before formally throwing in the towel and, and moving across to Horizon State. So we're all pretty excited to, to have somebody of his, his caliber uh, you know, really helping us get to that scale um, and manage things well at that scale. Awesome. Very, it, it just says everything about professionalism. You know, it's great to have someone like that on board that has run a giant company before because I feel like Horizon State's moving in that direction where it's going to also be a giant company with these partnerships that you're getting, of course. And I know there's going to be a lot more of exciting things coming out in the near future. So I'm probably going to have to have you on in a couple of months again to talk about your next exciting partnerships. But we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll get to that when we get to it. Awesome. Jamie, yeah. I want to thank you for sitting down to talk with us today. It's been really interesting to get the perspective on what's happening with your partnerships in Indonesia and what the developments at Horizon State have been. Pleasure. Good to chat again. Thanks, Mike. For sure.